I'm going to start this meeting. I'm going to call the Boston Region Metropolitan Planning Organization's TIP Project Cost Ad Hoc Committee meeting to order. Um, I'm going to share that this meeting can be accessed can be accessed uh, in person or virtually. Um, all participants will join the meeting with muted microphones. Please rename yourself to include your first name, your last name, and affiliation. Participants can mute and unmute themselves. To participate in the discussion, please use the raised hand function. You can find this by clicking either on the participants button at the bottom of the screen and a window will pop up with a raised hand button at the bottom or the reactions button in the toolbar. The presenter will then, um, I'll, I'll then call on, uh, on folks. If you're on the phone, you can also use the uh, star nine um, feature to raise your hand. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact uh, Kate White via the chat box at K or K White, W H I T E, at ctps.org or 857 702 3658. Um, this meeting is being recorded and it's uh, this meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards, web content, accessibility guidelines 2.1 level AA standards and revised section 508 standards. Again, if you require any additional accommodation in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact Kate White, MPO staff at kwhite, W-H-I-T-E at ctps.org or 857-702-3658. Thank you. So I'm Eric Barassa. I'm the Director of Transportation Planning at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, I'm going to call on folks, which is always challenging because I don't have my screen in front of me. But um, let's see. Uh, I did hear John Romano from MassDOT Highway. I think you're here, right? John? Yes, I am here. Sorry. Yep. Um, I need um, to leave about 1030-ish, Eric, because I have okay. outdoor advertising here. That's fine. Um, I, I heard John Bouchard was here as well. And MBT Advisory Board, is Brian Kane here? Good morning, Eric. Brian Kane is here. Great. And I know Len Diggins is here. Yes, we, you see. Um, what about Jim Fitzgerald from the city of Boston? Is Jim here? No, okay. Um, what about Jay Monty from city of Everett? No, Jay. Uh, Peter Pelletier from the town of Medway? I'm here. Thank you, Peter. Tom Bent from the city of Somerville? Uh, I'm here, Eric. Good morning. Good morning. And is Jen Constable here from the town of Rockland? Let's see, I don't think so. Um, okay, great. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. So um, the first item on the agenda, oh, actually, the second item on the agenda is public comment. Does anyone have um, a comment to make? Let's see, I don't see any public comments. So let's go to agenda item three, Matt Genova. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Awesome, thanks Eric. And good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all on another Thursday morning. Um, so I've got three presentations uh, for you all today, just like a few weeks ago, but hopefully it'll keep them short and sweet and keep the focus as always on a discussion with you all. Um, so all three of these presentations are really building on themes and questions that have come up in uh, the prior two meetings of this committee. Um, so hopefully we continue to, to move the ball forward on, on these co same conversations. Uh, as the last couple of meetings, I want to keep this conversational. So please feel free to jump in with questions or comments as I go. Otherwise, we'll stop in between every presentation and have uh, a fuller discussion. Uh, so the goal of this first presentation is to discuss possible interventions at or near the 25% design mark 
for TIP projects in an effort to avoid some of the significant cost increases that we've historically seen at this milestone. Uh, so before we get into that, uh, I want to follow up uh, with a little bit more information on a question that came up at our last meeting, uh, which is the extent to which cost increases differ across project types. Uh, so as you can see on this slide, the scale of cost increases varies across MPO investment program and across design stage. Um, so we certainly saw the variance across design stage at our last meeting, um, but this just breaks that same information out across uh, project types as well. Um, so overall, we're seeing larger cost increases for complete streets and major infrastructure projects with the smallest cost increases for bicycle and pedestrian projects. Um, but once we get down to the project type, these data should really be taken with a grain of salt, uh, as some of the sample sizes are pretty small and can be moved uh, one way or the other uh, by, you know, a single outlier or a couple of, of outliers. Um, just, you know, on that note, um, you know, in this data set, there are only three major infrastructure projects, uh, just two of which have made it all the way to 100% design. Um, so those numbers are really skewed by what happened with just those two projects. Um, you know, and similarly, there are only four bicycle and pedestrian projects, just one of which has made it all the way through the design process. And so really you're just seeing a very narrow window into, um, you know, what, what's going on with, um, with those projects. Um, again, just really based on, on the results from one project having made it all the way through. And so, um, so anyways, so that's sort of, I just wanted to provide this just to make sure we close the loop on, on some of those questions, but again, sort of take this with uh, with a grain of salt, if you will, and, and we can come back to this if, if folks have questions on any of this. So as we dive into this week's content, uh, it never hurts to do a quick refresher on where we left off from our last meeting. Uh, so as we discussed then, we see the greatest cost increases uh, between when projects are approved by MassDOT's project review committee and when they reach 25% design. So on average, we see a 43% cost increase at this stage with a median cost increase of 28%. Uh, and again, you know, the data shown here are for um, all of the projects combined into, um, into one rather than broken out by project type. Um, so again, as we talked about last week, all of the medians are lower than the averages. Uh, this is because we have a handful of projects in the sample that have a total cost increase of 150% or greater, which drives up the average quite a bit for um, for the total data set here. Uh, and again, the data set that we're using is a subset of 50 projects that the MPO has selected for funding over the last 10 years. Um, so clearly projects are not immune from cost increases after 25% design, as we see smaller but still significant cost increases when projects advance to the 75 and 100% design stages. Um, but that being said, the focus for today's conversation will really be on this first major design milestone after project approval, given that this is likely the highest impact stage of the design process for any possible policy interventions. So in our 50 uh, project sample, going back to federal fiscal year 2016, uh, projects have been first programmed in the TIP at PRC approval, 25% design and 75% design. So that's their design status when they're first selected for funding by the MPO. Uh, shown here are the percent changes in total cost from first programming stage to 100% design. Um, so this subset of 23 projects uh, that have made it <clears throat> all the way through 100% design includes six projects that were first programmed at PRC approval. So it's the two bars on the left hand side. Um, so those numbers represent the cost increases uh, for those six projects that again were selected at PRC approval and have made it all the way through to 100% design. Um, this data set includes uh, 14 projects that were first programmed at 25% design. So those are those two bars in the middle. And there you see um, that projects that were selected at that design stage, 25% design first, by the time they made it to 100% design, you know, they still did see some cost increases at about 25% um, on their base costs. Um, you can see that's significantly lower than those, those handful of projects on the left-hand side there that were selected at PRC approval. Uh, and then three projects were selected out of the 23 that have made it to 100% design in our sample. Um, three projects were selected at 75% design. Those are the two bars you see on the right-hand side. Uh, and so you can see when we are having projects enter the tip at a 75% design stage, 
um, their costs stay more or less consistent all the way through to 100% design and, and then advertisement subsequently. Uh, and you can see even uh, the average there. Um, I think we had one or two projects that actually decreased in cost from 75% design to 100% design. Uh, and so that's actually bringing the average down to a negative number, which is great. We'd love to see that for all projects, of course, but um, we know that that is not quite what we're dealing with, which is why we're all here today. Um, So this just, uh, again, sort of gives you a snapshot of, of sort of what we've seen based on when we select projects, um, you know, at their initial design stage when they enter the TIP and how they fare um, through their lifespan in the TIP. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the nuts and bolts of, project, of the project development process. Uh, this will cover some of what we touched on a few weeks ago, but hopefully the added detail will be helpful as we move towards discussing policy changes. So when a project is approved by MassDOT's Project Review Committee, which is the first major milestone in TIP project development, proponents are sent a letter from MassDOT detailing the project development requirements that they must adhere to moving forward. A copy of one of these letters is posted to the MPO meeting uh, calendar uh, on the MPO's website um, for anyone who'd like to pull it up for reference. So this letter contains several pages of requirements for programming and project development including how to get a project scored by the MPO, the frequency with which project costs should be updated, and the requirements for securing right-of-way and environmental permits, among many other things. Included at the outset of this letter are the basic conditions of PRC approval, which include the three items shown on the slide before you right now. Uh, so within two years of approval by MassDOT's Project Review Committee, project proponents must uh, receive MassDOT approval of their project scope and work hours, secure a signed contract with a consultant for the entire design process, and identify full design funding. In the event that these three milestones are not reached within two years, projects may need to be resubmitted to PRC for approval before they can move forward. Uh, resubmission to PRC may also be required in the event of significant cost or scope changes. Uh, and as we discussed uh, at our last meeting three weeks ago, um, these requirements uh, have really come into play over the last few years of TIP development. Um, so these have not been MassDOT's um, sort of PRC-based requirements forever, um, but um, going forward, these are, are the requirements that will be in effect, um, at least as things stand today. Um, and so again, you know, some of what we've seen historically with the really, really long timelines between when a project is first approved by the PRC and then it you know, reaches 25% design eight years later, something like that. Um, you know, these requirements haven't gone into effect a few years ago or designed to cut down on those really long lag times where projects just sort of hang around. Um, but this is the current state of play after PRC approval today. So after PRC approval, there are a number of steps that a project must complete before reaching an approved set of 25% plans. So I'll go over the highlights here, uh, but there is a way more detailed checklist of this process also posted to the MPO website. Um, this checklist is provided by MassDOT to project proponent, proponents uh, to help guide them through the early project development process. So again, uh, within two years of PRC approval, proponents need to have a designer under contract and have issued a notice for the design process to proceed. Within six months of the notice to proceed, Proponents need to have a project scoping meeting with MassDOT uh, and or have their project scope and cross-section reviewed by their MassDOT project manager. These steps are intended to identify any potential issues with right-of-way, utilities, environmental permitting, and public concerns early that they may be addressed before a project design advances significantly. Additional public outreach may be needed at this stage to clarify any issues that may come up. From there, the MassDOT project manager will review the project scope of work. If the scope or cost now differs significantly from what was approved by the PRC, uh, the project may need to be reapproved by the committee before moving forward. Once a final scope of work is agreed upon and any necessary reapprovals have been granted, a proponent may then submit a full 25% design uh, set for review. So as we discussed last meeting, this is a step where some projects can get hung up as incomplete or changing submissions can cause the 25% plans to be rejected. Many projects have their designs approved on their first submission, uh, but others can take as many as four or five submissions over a period of years before securing approval of their 25% plans. Um, 
So from there, formal design public hearings are then held uh, once those 25% plans have been approved by MassDOT and then 75% design submissions follow from there. So it gives you a sort of broad overview of the, of the basic process here, getting to at least 25% approval and the, and the design public hearing. Uh, but again, there's much more information on that uh, in the handout posted to the meeting calendar uh, for your review if you'd like to check it out. So in order to address project cost increases within this existing framework, there are at least three possible policy approaches to the 25% design milestone, which I'll outline on the following slides. Uh, the first option, of course, is to make no changes to our existing policy, which allows projects to be programmed in the TIP anytime after PRC approval. This, is, can be, this can be thought of as the high flexibility, high uncertainty approach. One benefit of this approach is that it maximizes the number of projects that the MBO, MPO can consider for funding in any given TIP cycle, as proponents are allowed to provide supplemental documentation and answer a uh, project questionnaire uh, in the event that they don't yet have a full 25% design set. This allows the MPO to allocate funding to promising projects very early in the project development process. Additionally, this approach can provide municipalities with an early capital funding commitment from the MPO, giving proponents a greater degree of certainty around their future investments in design funding. The drawbacks of this approach are that it fails to mitigate much of the cost increase risk to the MPO, given the significant cost increases that are often seen at the 25% design submission, uh, as well as that projects have a high degree of potential to change in design from what the MPO originally programmed. These changes may well be for the better in project design, uh, but without a robust project rescoring or monitoring system, this means that the MPO may have significant capital funding allocated to projects that it's actually not all that familiar with as the designs change over the project lifespan. So that's option one. Move now to option two, uh, which may be called the sort of low flexibility, low uncertainty approach, uh, which would be to require that projects have an approved 25% design before they are considered for programming in the TIP. One of the questions raised at the last meeting revolved around whether or not the MPO had any past policies that set 25% design as the threshold for programming. Uh, so I went back to at least the 2014 to 2017 tip cycle, which would be nine tip cycles ago. Um, and over the course of that whole time, the MPO has funded at least some projects before they've reached 25% design. Uh, so I couldn't find any documentation that stated a firm policy otherwise during this time. So it's likely been at least a decade since the MPO required projects to meet uh, the 25% design threshold before they could be considered for programming. Um, if there ever even was a formal policy on this at all. Uh, again, the, the details get a little bit hazy as we go back a, a decade plus, um, but at least in re recent MPO history, uh, the board has not had a, a formal policy around requiring 25% design before being considered for funding. So the benefits of requiring approved 25% plans prior to programming are that the largest source of cost risk to the MPO is mitigated. Uh, as well as that the MPO has a higher degree of certainty that the projects that actually go to construction are substantially similar to the designs originally approved by the board. One drawback of this approach is that it may limit the number of projects that the MPO has to consider for funding in any given tip cycle, given that the bar is higher for entry. Relatedly, uh, municipalities would be required to um, have funding spent all the way through 25% design without having any certainty of receiving capital funding for their projects. This would create, this could create a situation where municipalities with fewer resources are disadvantaged in the TIP process relative to their more well-resourced peers. A third approach could try to strike a middle ground between these first two, requiring that projects have an approved pre-25% project scope and updated cost estimate prior to inclusion in the TIP. This would allow for additional clarification and negotiation on project details to happen between proponents and MassDOT, pro providing a clearer picture of the project than what was approved by the project review committee without proponents needing a fully approved set of 25% plans, a milestone that could take several several more months or longer for a proponent to reach. Uh, so the result here is a, a moderate degree of flexibility, as well as a moderate degree of uncertainty, both for the MPO and for project proponents. 
So in addition to these three, uh, there are certainly other possible approaches as well. One idea that's been raised by this committee is to build in a larger contingency to more easily buffer against future cost changes. Such a contingency could be scaled based on when a project is first programmed with larger contingencies added for projects funded at PRC approval than those funded at 25% design. Could be one option. Another option could be to continue programming projects at any stage of design, but require that proponents cover any cost increases above the MPO's original programming amount. Still another approach could allow for some level of cost sharing of any increases uh, between MPO funds and proponent funds. Um, so certainly there are um, a number of options out here that um, are not included uh, anywhere on here. So um, please continue to sort of bring forward ideas in the discussion today uh, as we move towards that here in just a second. Um, so on that note, I'll end with some questions for consideration as this committee weighs potential policy changes. Um, three questions for you are first, uh, what is the appropriate balance between flexibility and certainty in the project selection process? Um, second, what, if anything, should be done for proponents that need additional support to reach 25% design? And third, uh, do policies on programming projects at a certain design stage change for those projects that are already programmed in the long range transportation plan? Um, so those are just a handful of questions that we might wanna think about as we discuss today. But with that, I will end there and open things up. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so why don't, let's discuss this, right, before we go on to the other ones. Okay, so what what questions or thoughts do, do folks have? I know that was kind of a, a lot there. Um, Ken Miller. Uh, thank you, Eric. Just, just a couple of questions about the, of the process. Um, so Matt, when, when does the MPO evaluate that? What, if, can you go back to the slide that has the uh, schedule on it of 25 days? So when does the MPO actually evaluate the projects? Is it after PRC approval or? Yeah, so um, so almost all the time it's, it's after PRC approval. We have, um, depending on the date of the PRC, that sort of final PRC meeting in the year before the MPO starts discussing uh, project selection in February and March, uh, we may start scoring a project before it's actually, you know, formally approved by the PRC, but then let the proponent know, you know, obviously if it, if the project is not approved by the PRC for some reason, then, you know, we would not move it forward in consideration for the board. Um, but typically projects try to, sort of, um, you know, get PRC approval sometime during the year prior to project scoring, starting in November, December, uh, and then you know dive right in to, to the process there. So most of the projects we're scoring now are just at at PRC approval. Right, and and the does the and I presume at some point after you do the evaluation, you let the proponent know, hey, this is the score you got. Does the MPO give them any other kind of signal? Hey, you got a really low score. Maybe you shouldn't invest it. <laughs> Uh, invest the money in design? I mean, is there any kind of signal that the MPO sends to proponents? Uh, yeah, way? so um, it's a really good question. So right now, um, there isn't a formal mechanism for this. You know, I'll say at the MPO staff level, if proponents reach out and say, hey, I'm considering a project that, you know, this may even be prior to PRC approval, um, you know, proponents will often ask, is this a good fit for, for MPO funding? And so staff will go over with them, like, these are the sorts of projects, uh, the MPO funds, you know, complete streets, bicycle pedestrian projects, et cetera, sort of let them know generally like how their project may fare. Um, and then, yeah, during the scoring process, uh, all proponents have an opportunity to review their draft scores. Uh, so everything that gets formally scored by MPO staff, uh, proponents can check out those scores, ask questions, um, you know, they may provide additional information that would change the score if, um, mm. you know, if there are questions uh, about, you know, the way something was determined. And so um, then those final scores, you know, once proponents have had a chance to take a look at them or what the, the board eventually sees. And, and, and Matt, you know, maybe this is a question from NASDAQ, but there used to be something called the pre-PRC process at NASDAQ where, the, where, where there used to be a meeting. And I think the MPOs used to, the staff used to get invited to these meetings, maybe they were quarterly, uh, where they discussed projects before they went to PRC because 
And I don't know if this is still the case, but back in the day, PRC was pretty perfunctory. Projects generally didn't get to PRC unless they were going to be approved. Uh, and so there was this pre-PRC process where the projects were, you know, the, the project evaluation, the the, you know, informa the PIFs and the, all the forms were, and the information was discussed like the district and headquarters. And I thought the MPO was invited. I don't know, the John or John, do you, do those things, do, uh, is there still a, a pre-PRC process? Does anybody know? Let me ask that. Uh, I can say at least from the MPO staff perspective, I've been to a handful of pre-PRC meetings um, but it seems, at least from my perspective, um, you know, I don't think the MPO is included in, in that conversation in sort of a systematic way. I think it's a little bit more ad hoc. Um, but I have sat in on, on some of those with, um, you know, like folks from the Mass Todd Highway Districts uh, and a project proponent to sort of talk through the basics. But, um, but that's certainly an opportunity, you know, if those meetings are happening, um, you know, in a more systematic way between Mass Todd staff and proponents that, maybe, you know, the MPO could. A play more well, this is the, yeah, my recollection is these the proponents were not at the meetings. It was really MassDOT and, and the and the NPO staff. Were, you know, both the district and headquarters would just talk about projects and see if there were any concerns before it went to PLC. So, all right, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. John. Hey, Eric. Thank you. Um, so, as you know, I look, you know. Looking, thinking over the stuff from last meeting, and then looking at the stuff that Matt has presented today and showed, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling more like it's less of a between PRC approval and 25% design. I really am starting to look at it less as a cost increase. Um, I think it's more that's the period of time where the project is really getting formalized off of and and uh, formulated actually more than formalized. And it's, it's, it's in that period, it, you know, I, I think we're, we may be incorrectly categorizing them as a cost increase because at PRC, it's kind of the basic level of what's, what they would like the project to be. And I mean, obviously not to 100% design that we know the whole thing, but many things change from PRC all the way up through the design public hearing um, because of community input, um, you know, Matt could be whether it's mass DOT utilities weighing in, and so I, I I feel like you don't really have a better handle on the project scope itself until 25% design is kind of approved. Um, so may, maybe though, you know, looking at a way to capture a um, I don't know if there's a, a you know a, a number or a formula or something a percentage that we put for projects that are approved at the PRC level versus the 25% level as Matt has discussed is one of the potential options. But I'm thinking of it that I'm really thinking that it's it's really not a cost increase at that level. I just think we don't you don't know the full scope of the project, and it's not like you know what you're doing and then all of a sudden you want the you know, gold benches instead of the bronze benches. And so there's a cost increase. You know, I, I, I think we have to look at it in two different levels. So um, that's a really good point. Um, and I, you know, what I find really interesting is, is that in, you know, in sort of discussing this, that it sounds to me like the MPO, we had some type of an unwritten policy, maybe a decade ago, where we were really, selecting projects that were at, at the very least at like sort of the 25% submission level, maybe they weren't formally approved or they hadn't had their 25% design hearing, but they were kind of at the submission level. Um, is that your sense, Matt? Yeah, it seems like there could possibly have been sort of an, an unwritten rule where, you know, projects were strongly encouraged to reach that, that threshold or something close to it. Um, but it seems like Perhaps you know more flexibility has been introduced over time, but again, it's, it was hard to find anything that was you know formally document, documented. In I, any way. I think what happened was that as we developed a more detailed project scoring criteria, so many people, you know, I'm, I see like Tom Bent here, you know, see other CTS staff like Annette. I mean, when I first started at at, at the NPO twelve years ago 
the scoring that we had was was very rudimentary it was like there was like a moon and a half moon i mean there was something like really like very simple it was like a like it, you were like kind of good bad or medium and um uh, over the past decade or more we've created a very detailed scoring system and i think what we've done is as that scoring criteria has gotten more specific we have basically said if a project is able to be scored we'll score it and then it's kind of eligible and so sometimes that that means the project has information that the proponent provides but it's it's just after prc we don't have that detail as john said so i i do think going back to something that is closer to 25 percent maybe it's not a full 25 percent approval but something like the submission has been in uh, and maybe it might be nice to clarify what the kind of difference is there but um i, I do think that's really important so uh len what calling on you now thank you um so a quick um, request from matt can, can you show me the slide for um, or show us the slide for um, options three Okay, um, and and maybe I'll save my question for later. If Mr. Miller can tell me if he's going to be here for the entire meeting. Do you, you have a question for Ken? Well, it, it would be yeah, it would be a question for Ken, but I can save it for later if he's going to be here for the for the entire meeting. No, go you go ahead now. Okay, uh, so the last meeting uh, we uh, there was some question as to whether it really was possible for. Uh, the MPO to fund design, and I was under the impression from something that Kenneth said in a meeting before then uh, that that was possible, but there was some question as to that. Can Ken chime in on that? Uh, well, it's an uh, design is an eligible federal ex uh, expense. All right. So it's eligible. Uh, Typically, MASDOC does not use federal funding for design, but uh, it's eligible. All right, All right. And then that's pretty conclusive. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, my my understanding about that, and maybe that's another thing that we could have staff look a little bit about, is sort of the pro and con of design. So, if you if you use the federal funds for design, then you have less money for construction. You know, it's not like you get more money for design. So that's one issue. And then if you do um, if we do program it for design, we do have to basically commit to funding the project. You can't just say we're going to fund the design, but then not like commit to funding it, the whole thing. And then my, under, my understanding is that once you do commit design to it, then there is sort of another level of sort of like, like oversight that's involved. Um, and can, I don't know, maybe you could yeah, yeah, well, there there is a there is a ten what's the so called ten year rule, which is a, if if federal funding is used for design and the project did not um, go to construction uh, uh, within ten years, then uh, we are allowed to ask for that money back. Uh, and so, um, in other states where they use use uh, funding for design, uh, that can be an issue when you you're trying to claw back money from a municipality uh, that uh, that already spent it. You know, so so there is the, there is a ten year. Okay. Well, I will, that, that thanks for that clarification because I mean part of the reason for wanting to um, fund design was so that if we got to a point where we thought this just isn't worth it, we we could say this isn't worth it and we're not going to do it. Uh, versus getting ourselves trapped because we have done uh, the design. Because the rationale is that if the municipalities can't afford the design work, I mean, and they, they get in the tip, they get, they get in the tip and then they find out this is costing a lot and we don't want to go, what well, we feel is if we have to keep going because we've had them put up the money. So if we would put up the money, then we, it would give us the flexibility to say, well, this isn't working out the way we thought and we feel free to full, pull the plug. But essentially what I'm hearing is that if we commit to the design, then we're essentially committed to the project. Yeah, or we have to pay the design back or we would make the municipality pay the design back, which I, I think doesn't like, which then doesn't fix the problem, which is that, you know, they don't, they would like to have some sense of commitment without having that risk in there. But um, I, I think that, I think what, what 
Matt has presented is, is maybe potential options to try to like balance, you know, balance that risk. Well, just just to be clear, though, I mean, would we have the option of paying for that design fee if we took on the design cost and we decided not to go forward with it? It is, I mean, as Ken said, it is something that is eligible for the federal dollars. It is something that has not really been been done, right? right. Yeah, you, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to use federal funds to pay back federal funds that you. <laughs> so right. yeah, uh, uh, right. so right. right. Got it. Okay. Well, I just need to understand the complexities in order to <laughs> push for one position or another. Thank you. Ben. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, I just wanted to check in. I think sort of this, these options two and three are, are pretty attractive. I think it's it's prudent for the MPO to, to really decrease some of this cost increase risk um, that it's facing. Um, just so that we can keep our sort of longer range commitments. Um, something I would like to hear a little bit more about. Um, I know one of the one of the difficulties Matt mentioned is, you know, municipalities committing to getting to that 25% without a commitment of funding. And if you looked at the materials posted to the website in the in the PRC approval level letter, it really is a robust set of things that that a municipality must complete in order to get to that stage. Um, and so I think there's, I think there's something there for sort of future discussion uh, at the MPO staff level um, of what capacity the MPO needs to have to support municipalities, particularly on projects that are regional priorities or long range plan priorities um, to getting to that milestone. Okay, thanks, Ben. Tom Ben. Hi, um, actually my question got answered, I think uh, between Eric and Ben, but uh, the, so I agree with uh, what Eric had said earlier about back how we used to do it 10 years ago uh, and to com uh, compare to what we do now, it's totally different uh, measurement criteria. Uh, but the, uh, in the one thing that I, I hear all the time from the, the different uh, municipalities is that you know, their, their concern is, is that if they spend their money and the, the project doesn't get um, approved, then they've lost, you know, two, $3 million. And, you know, for, for some cities that may not be as a big a deal as it is for some towns or smaller cities. So, it, it, so that's always been the dilemma is how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, so again, just bringing that up again, uh, I think you know there's some in between option two and option three. There may be something there, but I think we need to kind of dig dig into it a little bit more. Thanks. Um, th thank you, Tom. C can I ask this question, Matt and, and like and Ben? Um, and I don't know if John Bouchard is still here. He jumped on for a second, but I think he's he's gone now. Um, <clears throat> is the the difference between submitting like the like require like option three is require projects to reach the pre 25% scope approval. So essentially that is like you like that is a municipality they've done everything that they feel like meets the 25% requirement they've submitted that to um, They've submitted that to the district office or to MassDOT. Is that correct? And then it's the, it's getting reviewed. And if everything looks good, then they schedule the 25% public hearing? So um, yeah, so in option three here, the pre 25% uh, scope approval would be sort of an interim step between the level of detail included in the PRC submission, uh, which is really sort of a statement of, you know, what is the need for the project? You know, what are the safety issues? What are the, you know, congestion issues, what have you? Um, and what are the sort of what's the sort of basic proposal for addressing those. So that's like the level of detail at PRC approval. And then the level of detail at 25% design, like a full 25% design submission is a you know, full engineering, draft engineering documents um, that have you know, very detailed uh, plans. And so for option three here, this is sort of an interim step between those two things where um, you know, MassDOT staff have reviewed um, you know, the materials from PRC, those, that initial proposal had some follow-up discussions with the proponents to sort of hone that proposal and get on the same page about what really are the needs, what are, what are some good solutions for addressing them. 
um, but the proponent hasn't gotten all the way through, you know, with their consultant to actually submit formal plans that document um, that detail. And so, so this is sort of a halfway point between those two. Uh, and then feel free to add or correct if I'm, you know, mis <laughs> misrepresenting any of that. No, I think that's accurate. I, I think the the one thing I'll add is that you know if you really look through the pre twenty five percent scoping list, it's kind of a kind of a risk assessment, um, and so it's looking at every potential project holdup and saying, hey, have you looked at your curb ramps? Are they in good shape? Do you know what the utilities are like underneath? Like, are there any potential Article ninety seven nearby? And so it's, so it's sort of identifying, trying to identify uh, before the twenty five percent submission what are these potential sort of flags on projects that we know make them take longer, cost more, so that we can accurately assess the, um, the project cost earlier. And is this a formal like document or step or meeting that, that takes place? It's a formal step now. Um, it was a relatively informal process up until I believe this March, we formalized it. Um, so we don't have okay. too much practice with it. It was more for sort of potentially risky projects before on a case by case basis, but now it's it's kind of codified. It's okay. So it is like a, it either happened or it didn't happen kind of thing. I'm just I just want to be sure that we do, we're not going to fall into some gray area of like, yeah. well, you know, we yeah we submitted the thing, but we never heard back. Like it, it's a it's a formal step now that is is sort of codified in the process. Yeah, I imagine there's probably some sort of pavement projects that kind of walk through this step very quickly, um, but those aren't typically the types of projects the MPO is looking at. Okay. So, so we, we, it would be like, yes, they've done this or not. And that could be kind of like a, a defining line. And like you said, Matt, it's not as, it's not as far as long as the full 25. Um, my, the only concern here would be is that again, like, you know, closer to that 25% submission, you would you would have more understanding of the project and, and a better sense of, of cost. So this still leaves more, you know, more to be done and more potential for, for cost increase. Um, I guess it just depends on how, you know, how far we want to go. Brian Kane, I saw you had your hand up. Did you want to say anything? Um, I guess I, I just wanted to query the the, the comment here, um, the, the sort of the second con point, um, you know, without certainty of capital funding, I guess that, is, that assumes that um, the project wouldn't be funded by any other source. And I think it's important to note the cities and towns do have other options aside from the MPO via the bond bill process mm -hmm. and earmarks and whatnot. So um, I just think it's important that we don't we don't take a whole sort of like binary approach to this. It's either us or nobody. There, there are other options for cities and towns. That's all. Right, right. Um, okay, and then Matt, you had also posed a question about what is like, what are the implications for this for long range plan projects? Because the long range plan, we often identify projects a decade or more out um, and then, you know, like, let's use the example of, you know, like McGrath um, Boulevard or something like that. Like, you know, that's an example where that project is moving along, like in the design process. I think Massad has actually been doing a lot of it. Um, but your question here is, what if that does not, like, what if that's not happening? Like, do we get to a point where we say, you know, it's in the plan, but it's not meeting the, um, you know, the, this, this sort of 25% scoping threshold or something like, is that, is that the question that you're asking? And then do we then say, okay, we're, you know, we're, we're either pushing it off or we're taking it off the plan. Yeah. So I think, I think it was, yeah, sort of more of a general question on, you know, typically once a, once we've committed to a project through the plan process, then we say we're committed to it. Uh, which may be, you know, still the, the right approach, but um, obviously there is still a second level of decision where that project actually needs to be included in the TIP formally, um, you know, programmed into a specific year. And so, um, so this question is really here just to say, we should be thinking about that and, you know, whatever policy we end up with, we should be clear how we want to approach those projects as well, recognizing that the process can be a little bit different from, you know, the average 
you know, intersection project that just gets approved by PRC and comes straight into the into the scoring process. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, on, on that point, I, I did want to also emphasize it's not necessarily just the the sort of major infrastructure projects in the long range plan, but there's also all sorts of sort of regional priorities that might not necessarily, uh, they might be in communities that aren't, that don't have the capacity to push them forward or don't have the capacity to push them forward as quickly as other communities, but they're still sort of higher regional priorities than other projects. Um, and so I, I think that's another element to keep sight on is, is there's, there's just regional priority projects that don't necessarily move as quickly as others, but we wouldn't want to not program them just because they're not moving as quickly, if that makes sense. I, I no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you like? Can you give me an example? Or I, I'm thinking like if if um, there was like a major bike connection on like an existing network that that would really be a win-win for the the full region, but it happens to be in a municipality that hasn't done a project in a decade, and we don't think they'll be able to move it very quickly. Um, but it might be more important as sort of a regional network benefit than another project in a municipality that's very quick with projects and very good at projects. And so I wouldn't want to um, set up a system where a municipality with less capacity just has less potential to get on the tip, even if their project is sort of more regionally significant. So like if it's sort of a very high scoring, high priority project, I think there needs to be some potential for um, I, not fudging the rules, but providing some support or some extra yeah. opportunity to, to move that project ahead. I mean, we have seen examples of where, um, you know, the municipality is the proponent, they get on the tip, and then at some point, MassDOT says, like, you know what, we're just going to take this thing over, right? And, like, essentially takes over the design. Mm -hmm. And those happen for a plethora of different e it reasons. Tech, yeah, technical issues, politics, you know, lots of things. Is that sort of the point you're making? Like, yeah, yeah, some of those. I mean, also sort of the the, um, the priority quarters and sort of the other work that's identified through the long range planning process yeah. as like high risk areas, high crash areas, that sort of thing. Um, we just want to keep an eye on on those projects so we're not just programming whatever happens to move quickly. Um, thank you. Anne again. I just want to remind you that uh, last year when we were talking about the major infrastructure program um, and the definitions in that, you did adopt a policy of re making sure that you re will rescore all major infrastructure projects um, when they are ready for programming in the TIP mm -hmm. and that it would not be assumed that the project would automatically be programmed. So that you voted that out. That's uh, right. Last year. Thank you for that reminder. Okay, that's actually a good a good thing to remember. Len Diggins. Yeah, well, actually, I had something else between, since Ann just said that. Uh, and she's still here. I mean, did we didn't we also um, decide that we would review um, the LRTP for program projects that were in the LRTP every LRTP cycle, so they could also maybe fall out if they hadn't made any progress since the previous LRTP. Right. Right. Okay. That was the second policy that right. um, they you know the proponents would come in, and if they weren't moving forward then you could discuss removing them from the plan. Right. So another thing I raised my hand for um, was with respect to what Bennett said, I mean, because so, I got it and I think it's really important. You know, he raised a question, but, but maybe this isn't the right venue, but hopefully it is, I mean, that we can decide what we're going to do about these situations because there could very well be equity concerns, I mean, with these smaller communities or places that can't advance projects eh, more quickly. And, and it might be equity concerns in places where we don't expect them because they may seem like, you know, rich white communities, I mean, but the transportation projects are often, uh, I've, in my opinion, they affect more than the people that are in those communities. And if they can't build a certain project, it can affect people outside of that community I mean, who are part of the EJ community or just I mean, um, um, I mean equity based in whatever, whatever in various ways. Thanks. Yeah, no, we want to balance all that. I know, absolutely. Thanks, Glenn. Um, are there any questions about this first topic? Any, you know, I think we, I think we need to think about, I think it'd be good for all the members to think about kind of this question, kind of number one and two about, you know, where do we, 
you know, what is the kind of guidance? I, 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 th I know, I think we should make a policy that we're not going to select projects that are just at PRC or God forbid, not even approved by PRC yet. Um, I think the question is at what stage beyond that should our, should our policy be? So I think that's something we should all think about for our next meeting. So Matt, do you want to move forward to the next agenda topic? Sure. Uh, thanks, Eric. And yeah, thank you all for the good discussion there. Um, for our second topic today, uh, we'll dive into a more detailed discussion of potential methods for measuring cost effectiveness in the TIP programming process. Um, so the implementation of some form of cost effectiveness scoring would seek to accomplish no fewer than three goals. Um, first, cost effectiveness would provide a measure of how efficient projects are in accomplishing the MPO's goals for the region. In other words, how much funding is required for projects to address, address a crash cluster, add a mile of bike lane, or improve uh, bus reliability along a corridor. Second, cost effectiveness would be a useful tool for reevaluating projects when costs or scopes change. This would help the MPO answer questions like, is this cost increase worth funding because it adds certain benefits? Or does this scope change not enhance the project standing relative to its peers? And third, an ideal outcome of cost effectiveness scoring would be to encourage project proponents to value engineer their projects, seeking more efficient ways to achieve the same benefits. To start to get a feel for how cost effectiveness scoring could be used, MPO staff tested three different methods. Each of these tests used a 45 project subset of our 50 project sample. As these 45 projects were all scored by the MPO and had reached 25% uh, design submission. The scores used in these examples are from the MPO's former TIP evaluation criteria. Um, so these are the criteria that would have been in effect, um, not this most recent TIP cycle, but the TIP cycle prior and earlier. Um, and these were used because this provides an even basis of comparison across projects as the same criteria were used for the, the all the projects. Um, projects, projects, uh, Costs are those used at 25% um, at design, as this allows projects who have passed their largest cost increase milestone, while also giving us a sizable sample of projects to work with. Again, there are 45 projects in the sample out of our total 10-year um, sample of 50 projects. So in test one, the cost effectiveness measure used is points per $1 million. This involves a simple calculation where project score is divided by cost, and that resulting number is multiplied by a million to get, again, points per $1 million. Instead of showing the raw ranking of projects based on points per $1 million, the result is plotted here against project cost. The reason for doing this is to show the general relationship here, which is that the lower the project cost, the higher the cost effectiveness score will be. I'll touch on this more in just a minute. Um, and I'll also note uh, that each test that I've used here, all three of these examples, um, shows the results categorized by project type, and you see the color coding down at the bottom under the chart. In test two, project cost was divided by evaluation score, producing a cost effectiveness measure of cost per point. The ease of this calculation may make it a slightly more appealing option than points per $1 million, like in the previous example. The general relationship, however, is the same as what we just saw on the last slide which is that higher cost projects will fare worse on a cost per point measure. Um, that is higher cost projects tend to be more expensive on a per point basis. That trend holds true across project types. So what can we make of these first two tests? As we just noted, low cost projects will generally score better in either of these cost effectiveness measures. This is the case regardless of project score, as there isn't a broad enough range of project scores to match the broad range of project costs. In other words, uh, the lowest cost projects may be one tenth of the cost of the median cost project, but the lowest score projects will be about one half the score of the median score project. So again, the spread isn't quite as large um, for cost uh, or for score rather than it's for cost. And so that produces this effect where generally speaking, the cheaper a project is, the better it looks in, in the cost effectiveness scoring, 
regardless of its actual uh, evaluation score using the MPO's criteria. Uh, so in a hypothetical TIP cycle with $100 million in funding to spend on new projects, let's say that we ranked projects from 1 to 45 in our sample on a cost per point basis, and then selected projects down the list until our funds were exhausted. 24 projects could be funded using this method, but 21 of these 24 projects would be among the 24 lowest cost projects. In other words, nearly all of the projects selected would simply be the cheapest ones under consideration, regardless of how they scored using the MPO's project selection criteria. Given that these first two cost effectiveness tests don't tell us much new information as standalone measures, uh, given that they're really just a way to reframe our existing knowledge about project cost. Um, test three sought to approach cost effectiveness scoring in a different way to see if, a more new, if more nuanced results could be produced. This approach is the one used by the Atlanta Region Transit Link Authority, where project score is plotted against cost per point, with tiers created to prioritize projects for funding. As you can see here, the results are more of a true scatter plot rather than a trend line. Uh, with some with somewhat similar numbers of projects falling into each quadrant. In this approach, tier one projects that are high score and low cost per point, cost per point are prioritized for funding first. Tier two projects, which are those that are either low score, low cost, and high score, high cost, are prioritized next. And then tier three projects, those that are low score and high cost, are not prioritized. Uh, I'm going to keep moving through these, but we can come back to these plots uh, if you have questions on, on some of this here at the end of the presentation. Uh, so I'll say that Atlanta's four quadrant model is part of a broader prioritization system in which projects are scored using project level criteria, just like we do the Boston MPO, um, ranked against projects of the same type, again, like we also do, and then also ranked against all projects across types. Uh, and then from there, they are scored for cost effectiveness before being assessed on their alignment with the regional plan. So uh, several factor uh, project prioritization process here, uh, some of which overlaps with the current Boston MPO process. The benefit of the four quadrant approach is that it produces more nuanced results than a simple ranking, recognizing that low scoring projects may still be worth funding if they're also relatively affordable on a cost per point basis, and high cost per point projects may still be worth funding if they score well relative to their peers. In the test case here, the dividing lines between tiers were set at the medians for both project score and cost per point, but these um, uh, lines, these dividing lines across quadrants could be adjusted according to MPO policy preferences and goals. In short, uh, the results of the four quadrant test are as follows. Nine projects would be prioritized for funding in tier one. Of note, six of these nine projects are in the middle third of the cost range, meaning that the system did not inherently prioritize projects that were simply the lowest cost. 14 projects were in each tier two quadrant, including most of the projects at either end of the cost spectrum and eight projects fell into tier three, many of which are moderate cost projects. In summary, standalone cost effectiveness measures uh, like cost per point or points per $1 million will lead to the prioritization of low cost projects over all others, regardless of project evaluation score, at least under the current MPO's evaluation criteria. Uh, additionally, a tiered system more clearly illuminates relative project value, prioritizing projects that score well and are, efficient at, and are efficient at doing so, while also keeping the door open for projects that are expensive, also relative, relatively affordable. Of note, both the simple ranking approach and the tiered ranking approach rely on the MPO's project evaluation criteria as the measure of project benefit. This means that other measures of project efficiency, uh, things like cost per lane mile or cost per user, have not been included. These other options are by no means off the table at this point, uh, but these tests would be pretty labor intensive. And so a more uh, robust discussion should be had uh, 
among this committee on whether or not um, that is desired to, um, to look into further before MPO staff would take action to, to do that. Um, and again, we are happy to do so, but just wanna make sure that that's something that you all would be interested in pursuing before um, pulling that information together. As we consider options for implementing some form of cost effectiveness scoring, the following question should be addressed in some way. First, uh, when should cost effectiveness scoring be used in the TIP programming process? Uh, second, how should benefits be measured if not by MPO evaluation score alone? And third, should projects be rescored after cost or scope changes of a certain scale? And obviously, what would that scale be? And then what, if anything, happens when a project drops to a lower tier or below a certain threshold of cost effectiveness uh, in either of these um, cost effectiveness systems? So stop there. There's a lot of information very quickly, but again, happy to take questions uh, and clarify anything that was talked through. So Matt, I have a number of sort of questions, but I can, I, I'm happy to save mine for other folks, but if I don't see any hands raised, maybe I will ask my question then. Uh, Ken Miller. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> no, go, no, please go ahead. Uh, just about the, the cost effectiveness. I mean, the cost effectiveness uh, criteria, uh, system that you use doesn't, I mean, I mean, this is uh, the results that you showed matter, I think are what you would expect because your cost effectiveness criteria do not really account for the size of the project. So uh, in general, the, the lower, uh, if you divide just the total cost by the score. Uh, so for example, a 10 mile bike project could have the same, a pretty close score to a one mile bike project, but of course a 10 mile bike project is gonna cost 10 times. You know, you know, everything else being equal would cost 10 times as much. And so uh, based, you know, the efficiency just using points uh, would be drastically different for the you know much larger project. So uh, it's not clear to me that that using the points uh, in and of itself is uh, <clears throat> would, uh, would maybe be the best way to go. In terms of your other you know criteria, you know the unit cost, whether it's cost per mile, cost per intersection, whatever. Um, again, none of these things are mutually exclusive. You know, more information I guess is generally better than uh, less information. And uh, none of this should ever be a, you know, either your scoring criteria or evaluation score, whatever it is you do, uh, sh you should not uh, use anything as a black box uh, and, and presume that, you know, you know, just because something is a 6.3 versus a 6.2 is better and that NPO should do it. And then you, and so so I, I, I would be a proponent for, again, I think unit costs um, you know, I wouldn't use unit costs as a as a, an automatic ranking, but it is another piece of information. So, you know, the example I used before is that you know the Belmont project is twelve million dollars a mile bike project, where there is no other no, no other bike project that's more than five million dollars a mile. That doesn't mean the Belmont project is not a good project. It it just it's just information for the MPO on. You know, to know that when, when the MPO is trying to, you know, do they want to get a mile's worth of a bike path for $14 million, you know, $14 million or do they want to get five miles worth of bike path for $14 million? So um, I'm not sure that the unit costs, uh, getting that information would be that onerous, but you know, obviously that's not, I'm not doing it, so it's easy for me to say, uh, but, uh, uh, but I think you, you really need to be careful about using using the points, the evaluation points uh, uh, in and of itself uh, in this instance. If, if, your, if your evaluation system did account for the size of the project, then yes, I would say yes, that would be, you know, that would be a good way of doing it. Uh, good. Thank you. Th thank you, Ken. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that you bring up the, the Belmont project because like what, like, um, what I was thinking is how you, you know, how you try, like, it, like how we try to get it understanding um, the changes of a project as it goes up, like as it, as the score changes or how, as the pro, as the project goes up in cost. And so for like the Belmont project, you know, we think of it as a bike <clears throat> trail from Belmont Center 
I forget to like Brighton Street, but um, a huge part of that cost is that there's a there's a tunnel under the railroad tracks so that um, school children don't cut across that the live, you know, Fitchburg line. And so that's a huge drive. I mean, that's a probably a half of the cost or more or something like that is that is that tunnel. So it's I mean, it's, in some ways, it's really a tunnel project with a <laughs> with a bike lane, bike trail on top of it. But um, but I guess my question is, um, is the both like the the two tests that you looked at are the are they the, all of that's in comparison to each other right all those projects are somehow like when you're when you're doing them and you're doing it in the quadrants like you're inherently they're it's like you're looking at them based on their relationship to each other is that is that correct Yeah, so I mean, this is really just a, a way to say, you know, if we have more projects than, than we can fund, how do we begin to get a sense for which ones you know, are the sort of highest value based on our scoring criteria? You know, as Ken noted, you know, there are certainly other measures that we could introduce as, as complementary to an evaluation like this to, to get other sorts of, um, of ways to get a sense of, of value. Um, but yeah, using like plotting these here and then using the, the medians for score and cost per point is really just a way to say of this sample, how do these projects compare to each other and how would we select from them? Right, because I feel like what the reality of what typically happens is when we when it comes time for us to do the tip, we find out that like, you know, maybe there's four, five, six projects that have changed in cost. And what I'm trying to figure out is how do we, you know, how, how can the MPO have a policy to do something besides just commit to them? And I feel like what I'd like to figure out is a way to say, okay, we, we're adopting a policy that says we're going to have the option of, of, you know, we can continue to commit to projects as they go up in costs. We can ask them to, we can say to them, we're only committing to the money we've already <coughs> programmed um we can you know we can ask them to change their project or, or scope it back or something but i'm trying to understand is how we could evaluate among you know those four or five projects to determine what kind of action we want to take based on the on those projects and so um i'm kind of interested in understanding like when a project goes up in cost from when we originally programmed it like trying to understand like is there a way to understand like well what's changed and do we like and do we like the change and if we like the change do we want to you know commit to the 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 increased funding associated if we don't like the change and and you know i, I guess i'm just trying to understand the sort of the nuance there cuz cuz ultimately what we'd like to do is you know is do some things at the front to try to make sure that that, that when we program it the cost is closer to what it actually ends up being but then I, I also think it's important to have something in place so that when projects do go up in in cost dramatically we have the option of doing something besides just committing to it tom bent i mean eric I, I agree you know one of the big frustrations i think especially this last time around you know we got hit with a, a lot of last minute cost and so, you know, my thought process is on this is that, and, and a lot of it was, you know, for for right or wrong or whatever, it was mass dot costs that were added towards the end. So, you know, my thought is is you know we really want to pressure, you know, uh, you know whoever's submitting you know a tip project to to make sure all these costs are in when we're um, uh, you know when when they're going for the approval and the tip. And I think I think you're right about you know we, we may may have to be able to say, listen, if this you know goes up, you know we we may not or we will not you know fund any more than this you know so you either have to gonna you know go back to your design value engineer it or, or whatever because you know uh, it's a domino effect because you know you know what happens is like this year you know we had to play around to to make things work but that means projects that may have been able to get on the tip for this year, we're pushed back another year. So I think that's the frustrating part about this is, uh, and, and, but I think, 
making sure the consultants that are you know doing this work understand what mass thoughts requirements are you know fully uh whether it's police details or you know you name it so that they are building those costs in you know up front so that when we're seeing it at the tip level you know we're seeing a project that should be pretty close you know and now, if the project gets delayed, we know there's a 4% increase every year, that type of thing. And one of the things I brought up before is that inflation factor, maybe we should be looking at that as 4% enough because if a project is at 25% design, but it sits for five years, you know, it's 4% enough every year uh, to factor into that enough. And, you know, is that that 4% has been there as long as I've been there. And I know, especially right now, construction costs are going through the roof. So that's a, that's another area that we you know we want to make sure that we're not hurting a project because it is being set aside and that four percent is being added. And then all of a sudden, five years later, it went up twenty percent, but it really went up thirty percent. You know, so just some areas that you know where where I've been frustrated with these last minute costs coming in, and uh, it just makes you know trying to uh, nail down the tip uh, even harder. Thank you, Tom. Len. Thank you. I mean, well, just to the, the inflation thing, Tom, I'll just say what I've said repeatedly is like, we got to compound it. I mean, and if we don't want to compound it, I mean, then we need to increase the number to kind of fudge out compounding. Uh, but but uh, in terms of the unit cost, maybe a quick and dirty way to get at that uh, would be to um, do the division, not only by the overall number of points, but also by the number of points for any given set um, subset of criteria, uh, because what I really like about the last um, round of um, criteria revision we did um, is that we uh, we really did a lot of work with each of the categories. And I remember when looking at uh, a couple of projects that had similar scores, when I looked at the subset mm -hmm. of the um, scores, it became clear to me which project I would select, uh, whereas before, uh, it would have been hard for me to decide because the overall scores were so close together, but within certain categories, subsets of the scores, I mean, uh, the areas that I cared about before one project was much better than another. So again, that might be just a quick way, given what we already have, to get at those unit costs without having to do a whole lot more work. That's it, thanks. So I was having a similar thought to Lens, which is, um, what is the maximum score that we have? Is it like 120 points or 150 points? Um, so in the in the numbers that are used here under the old criteria, the max was 134 points, but under the new criteria, it's an even 100 points. It's an even 100 points. What if, and this is just an idea, what if we said, like, you know, if a project scores a 75 or over, no matter what, we're going to stick with it. If it scores within 50 and 75, we're going to reevaluate it if the project goes up and we we have like a bunch of different tools to do that we can look at you know this quadrant method we can look at cost per mile we can look at cost per you we, we have a bunch of different ways to look at it and it's going to be a kind of a qualitative thing but we're just going to make it known to people that if you score like when we program you on the tip if you're between a 50 and a 75 and you go up in cost you know you're not you're you're good but you're not great we're gonna we're gonna commit to the great ones, but we're we're gonna, and it, and then if you're below a fifty, you know the chances that we we increase your costs are are very low. Or, I don't know. We we come up with something ahead of time where we we do it like that, and at least that gives us what I'm what I'm striving for is like transparency for the proponents because I think what's really hard is you have a town come in and they say like, oh my god, you know this has gone up, and you know we this is so important to us. I think it's really hard as MPO members to say, I'm sorry, like we, it's, that's not good enough. I think the, the, the reaction is going to want to be to keep the commitment. And I think the, the earlier and clearer we can be about what our sort of policy and what the options are, I, I think the better that is. I also think that's kind of a stick out there for, for prop proponents to to know that there there are consequences and that and 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 that it, we're not just going to fund everything that goes up that will be sort of a little bit of a, a stick out there for them to want to keep costs down for get get information on time advance projects you know as efficiently as possible Ken Miller 
Uh, I think that that's a that's an interesting uh, approach, Eric, and and I think I think that uh, you know some something that includes that uh, I think could be helpful. You know, the the thing to be careful about would be that re remember the way the way the evaluation scoring works uh, to some extent is that the more stuff you throw in, the higher your score gets uh, to some to, to a certain extent. So you would need to be careful about encouraging folks to stuff in to get their score higher. Uh, but a way to mitigate that would be to, all, again, also use some kind of unit cost measure to sort of then be able to identify, you know, outliers and, and something like that. Right. So, so, you know, so you need to, you need to be careful about encouraging people to increase the scope to raise their score. Uh, but there may be ways to mitigate, you know, mitigate that too. Yeah, I guess if I might uh, jump in with a, a thought here, this is, yeah, Eric, first time to your sort of initial question that you posed. Um, I mean, one way to approach cost effectiveness scoring would be to use it basically as an internal assessment for each project. And so when we initially score a project at 25% design or whatever our, our threshold is um, for initial programming, and then we select it for, for funding, it goes in the tip, um, you know, we we then from there would say, okay, if your cost goes up by, you know, 10% or more, we'll rescore it. We'll, we'll rescore, um, you know, the project as a whole. So we'll look at the new scope, your score may go up, um, but your cost may also go up. And then we could basically do sort of an internal assessment to say like, okay, your original cost per point when we programmed you was $250,000, but now your cost per point, even though your score went up is, you know, $300,000. And then we could basically say like, you know, there's some sort of, you know, threshold essentially for an increase in cost per point beyond which there would be some sort of, you know, reassessment or consequence. I don't know. Um, but it, then it would basically be, you know, less about how do projects compare to each other and really more about what's going on with this project. If there are new benefits, we're recognizing those in the score, but we're also taking a second look at the cost and saying, you know, Obviously, if the cost goes up a little bit and the score goes up a lot, maybe the cost per point goes down and we say, like, that's great. You know, I mean, that's even though we're spending more, it's an overall improvement. But I don't know, it's just sort of thinking out loud here, but that perhaps one way to think about cost effectiveness scoring um, less as a measure across projects and more as a measure within each project. Right. Um, <clears throat> what other questions or comments do folks have on this one? I, I think for our next meeting, I think what we need to think about is just like with the with the other point, at what level, you know, do we do we want to say, okay, this is we're not going to put a project on the tip unless it meets, you know, the the pre, the pre 25 scoping or the 25 submission or something like that. I think for this one, we should think like what what do we want to do when a project goes up in cost? How do we want to handle that? Because inevitably they will. Yeah, even if we have the best thing in place, like we're still going to see projects go up in cost. Right now, all we really do is com just commit to them. And maybe we say that's good enough and we don't want to do any type of re-evaluation. But I think if we did establish a policy that says like, your, you know, your project is going to be reevaluated if you go up in cost, I do think that would create more of an incentive for project proponents to be, be mindful of, about that. Um, so I think even if we didn't act on it that often, just having that policy out there, having a transparent policy, I think is is beneficial. Um, I think the way we do it is really is really important. Um, so we need to you know give some give some thought to that. I, I, I yeah, I, Matt, I kind of like that idea you have about you know doing some type of scoring beforehand and then you know for every everyone gets a cost effectiveness score at some point and then you re redo it and then you try to show the difference and that could be a way of of um, providing some information for making a decision to to the board so i think i think everyone needs to just think a little bit more about what you know what do they think about th this type of an approach okay so let's go on to um the 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 third section. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, I'll 
hopefully make this uh, short and sweet here because I know we're running a little bit tight on time. Um, for our final discussion today, I'll cover a little bit about how MPO staff currently engage with TIP project proponents uh, and the sorts of opportunities that may be available for us to enhance this engagement so that all parties, uh, proponents, consultants, the MPO board and staff, and MassDOT staff uh, can all work together to keep projects on track. Uh, so this is a timeline of a typical year for the TIP process. Um, so for longtime board members, this probably looks painfully familiar to you. You've seen this, you know, dozens of times. Um, proponent engagement every year uh, begins in earnest in September with an open call for new projects to all TIP contacts. Uh, every municipality in the region has a TIP contact. Uh, this person is usually a planning director, a DPW director, or a town engineer. Uh, and this person takes the lead on coordinating any TIP related needs with MPO staff. These TIP contacts tend to be the primary point person in a municipality for any and all future communications on project status and cost in the event that a project is selected for funding by the MPO. Uh, so as we get further into the fall each year, MPO staff focus outreach in on current and prospective project proponents, that is municipalities that have projects funded in the current TIP and municipalities that want a project funded in the next tip. This engagement takes the form of how-to workshops for prospective project proponents and one-on-one -on -one meetings with both, both prospective proponents uh, who want to discuss their new project in more detail and current proponents who want to provide an update on their currently programmed projects. In December and January, most staff proponent engagement is focused on the scoring of new projects which then gives way to broader conversations with all current and prospective proponents as we get into making programming decisions for the new TIP uh, in February through April. But at this stage, uh, a lot of proponent engagement really centers around the outcome of the TIP readiness day when MassDOT staff provide updates on all currently programmed projects to MPO staff. In these conversations, any projects with cost increases or schedule delays are flagged, which tends to prompt a good deal of proponent engagement when this information is shared back out with them. At this time, proponents with cost or schedule issues are encouraged to come to an MPO meeting to provide an update on their project to the board, which is why we tend to see a rush of public comments submitted on the TIP between February and April. Once programming for the year has been drafted, all TIP contacts are encouraged to review the draft TIP and provide comments if they would like to do so. This is when proponent engagement ratchets down a little bit in the summer, uh, when communications will begin to go out uh, in preparation for the next TIP cycle, again, starting sort of in the September, October timeframe. So several key takeaways can be gathered from this current proponent engagement timeline. First, uh, much of the communication between MPO staff and project proponents is focused on developing the new TIP. This means that information on current projects is often only shared during crunch time in the spring when decisions need to be made by MPO staff and the board. Uh, during this chaotic period of the year, project updates can often be inconsistent, incomplete, or unavailable, with little time for MPO staff to track down the finer details of where every project stands so that, that information can then be shared with the board for decision-making purposes. Uh, second, proponents are not explicitly required to interact with the MPO board or staff once their projects have been programmed in the TIP. Proponent engagement is encouraged and requested, but there are relatively few consequences for not doing so. Because proponent engagement isn't required at any point beyond the initial scoring process, uh, it tends to largely be driven by project-related crises, like significant cost increases or pers prospective schedule delays. This is very much a reactive way of fostering engagement between proponents and the MPO, with the focus on resolving any cost and schedule issues in the early years of the TIP, so that a new fiscally constrained capital plan can be drafted by early April every spring. And finally, MPO staff do engage MassDOT highway district staff and project managers throughout the year, but this also tends to be on sort of an as needed basis in the event that questions arise on projects or new projects warrant discussion. There is no regular check in time or schedule between MPO staff and MassDOT district staff or project managers. Um, and MassDOT district staff and PMs uh, seldom participate in directly in MPO board meetings. 
we'll say uh, every fall when uh, MPO staff are putting out the call for new TIP projects. Um, that is one time every year where uh, MassDOT Highway District staff are certainly engaged. You know, we talk with them to say, are there new projects on your radar? Um, do you have information on projects that are that are coming in? Um, but beyond that, there really isn't a formal a formal check in schedule that happens on a defined basis. So there are lots of uh, possible options for in enhancing engagement between project proponents and both MPO staff and the MPO board. On the MPO staff side of the ledger, uh, there could be required check ins for current project proponents, either at specific times of the year or at specific project development milestones, things like 25% submission, 75% submission, etc. Proponents could be encouraged or required to submit updated project documentation to MPO staff as their project design advances. MPO staff could also set regular check ins with MassDOT Highway District staff and project managers. And MPO staff could create additional materials to help guide proponents through the project development process, uh, similar to the TIP guidebook created by SERPED that we referenced in our last meeting a couple of weeks ago. On the MPO board side of things, uh, proponents could be required to present to the MPO on their projects when there are major costs or schedule changes. Proponents could sign an agreement with the MPO that includes certain expectations or requirements for their project's lifespan in the TIP. This would be sort of an MPO specific version of the PRC approval letters uh, that MassDOT sends out to proponents. And those are the letters that we discussed back in the first presentation today. The MPO could bring back a more limited version uh, which happened once upon a time and were a, a two-day affair where presentations by project proponents took place uh, when they were seeking funding. This would provide the MPO board with an opportunity to engage directly with every prospective project proponent to ask questions and further evaluate project merits. And finally, the MPO could request that proponents submit information on their project documenting its completion. So provide a way to gauge the success of projects funded by the MPO while offering some more tangible closure on the project development process. Um, so there are lots of ideas here, but this is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, so additional thoughts beyond this are, are certainly more than welcome. Uh, in discussion, discussing options for further proponent engagement, I uh, want to again pose sort of a handful of questions here. Uh, first, should certain proponent actions be required? And if so, how should this be enforced? Um, second, what is the best format for MPO members to receive updates on projects? And third, which engagement option, options are the most important to implement of the selection that I just talked through or uh, any other ideas that you might have? Um, and so this is a, I'll stop there. There's a very quick crash course just on sort of where we're at and, you know, some potential paths forward, um, but definitely want to hear your thoughts on, on any and all of this. So I will note that we, you know, we've lost a few folks um, in this meet. Len, you're back. Were you were you gone? Um, no. Okay, no. you've been. I wasn't gone. Time. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Len. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you were going to say stuff to me. So who who have we lost? Um, for some reason, you were off my my list, but maybe you were just uh, like down or something. So I thought we had lost yeah. you. I know we've lost folks from from um, the highway. Division. I know we lost Brian Kane. We don't have Jay Monty today. We don't have anyone from uh, the city of Boston. So um, maybe we can, we can talk about kind of next steps at the end. But um, but yeah, right. no, Len, yeah. Let, let's let's well, try to answer these questions. Then. Sure, <clears throat> because I mean, part of what I was going to ask I me mean, maybe involves some mass dot people. I was kind of wondering, like, what does what does um what does mass dot do in terms of uh, when it takes on a program? Well, there are two aspects to this. It's like, uh, and maybe another thing is like. Can we coordinate with MassDOT? I mean, in terms of how we select programs. I mean, I think there is some point in which there's coordination, but I thought Brian brought up a good point, and that is that the MPO isn't the only source of funding I mean, for these projects. I mean, uh, and if we could maybe coordinate better, I mean, we could uh, maybe take some pressure off of us when it comes to uh, how we program. But another question is: is how does MassDOT handle it when it it funds a program and it's working with municipality and and um, the costs go up. So Ben, do you want to try to answer that? And I can, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak a little more to the to the level of coordination. I think with the cost changes, the process is pretty similar. Um, 
we try to identify where we have available funding um, and how we are going to balance the budget there and then bring it um, usually we need to bring that before the MPO for a, a TIP amendment as well. Um, so it's a pretty similar process. Um, but on the coordination side, um, so we, we have the mass project managers who sort of have a, a suite of projects they're working on and they're sort of work, working directly with the municipality and paying close attention to that. Um, but this is something that the district project development engineers are, are also key players in. Um, so they typically are paying close attention, um, sort of similar to how, how um, a lot of the MPOs do, to all the projects in the district and what the schedules are, what the timelines are. So they have the, the project development calendars and that sort of thing. And so they know when a project's missed a milestone and when to sort of follow up on, on oh, this project's moving a little slower than we expected. Let's call the town, let's set up a meeting um, with the project manager and with environmental or whoever happens to be the, the milestone and, in question. Um, and I do think there's a lot of opportunity there for increased collaboration. Um, most of the other MPOs I, I personally work with only have one district, so they have a little simpler time um, coordinating that effort. Um, but Boston's not the only one with multiple highway districts. So something I've noted is just getting some more feedback from some of the Western regions and the Northern regions on how they do the district collaboration. Um, but, you know, the project proponents do submit their calendars, um, their development milestones, all their submissions, and they CC the project development engineers in the district on all those communications. Um, so it's something where I think the MPO staff could insert themselves into that process and let, let, the, let the project proponent know, you know, if, if Matt doesn't have a project, count, a project development schedule and doesn't know when the next milestone is, then you know, Matt's not going to recommend <laughs> that the MPO endorse an amendment based on some information because they're not communicating with the MPO, um, which is sort of similar to how CERPID manages theirs uh, sort of actively. So I, I, I feel like that was a little a bit of a meandering response. So <laughs> feel free to ask a follow up question, of course. No, thanks. That was helpful, Ben. I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, Matt, <clears throat> for all those sort of things like MPO staff options, you know, having more kind of touch, you know, touchstones with the projects, you know, is that something that, you know, that you all have discussed is like, you know, you guys could take on or does that, would that require more resources? Does that require a trade-off, which means we'd have to dedicate, you know, more funding away from planning studies into, you know, this type of stuff? Like, have you guys thought about that? So yeah, the short answer is we have not had a robust internal discussion on what all this looks like. You know, I think today was really just about putting a bunch of ideas on the table to sort of see, um, you know, what resonated with, with you all and, and just get the conversation going. You know, I do think, um, you know, obviously if we decide to move <clears throat> more of those staff level engagements, we would have to be, um, you know, we'd have to have to think critically about the best way to do that um, with existing bandwidth. And obviously, you know, that sort of begs the question if there needs additional bandwidth, like what are the possibilities for that? So, um, you know, that's something that we again, haven't discussed uh, in any in any serious way yet, but, um, you know, depending on sort of the outcome of the work of this committee, you know, that's a conversation that we could continue to, to think about, um, you know, and there's certainly ways to sort of streamline some of these processes. So, so they're not necessarily all that labor intensive. It just requires some, you know, upfront thought about how to, um, you know, to Ben's point, how to best engage with the districts and, and other folks um, to make that process sort of simple and, and straightforward. I mean, I definitely think <clears throat> if there can be more, um, you know, staff engagement with the projects, like that can be, you know, sort of a preventative measure, you, you know, so that we're, on, we're, we're staying on top of things and you're also, you know, we're kind of encouraging folks to, to move along, you know, in the process. Um, I, I think that's, I think that's, you know, would be great if we can do more of that. Um, I, I do remember, you know, many years ago when we did have this sort of like tip day and it was, bef you know, we would say, if you got a project, come and present to the MPO. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I don't, I didn't find it to be super productive. It was like, they were long days. They were two like six hour days. Um, pro proponents would come in, 
it was a lot of it was driven by their consultants. They would we would get a, a very quick presentation. It, it felt very rushed, um, and it and honestly, at that point, it wasn't really about addressing like cost increase. I, and I don't even think it was really that beneficial. Um, I do think that having a regular sort of checkup or, or, or a regular presentation from uh, proponents who are on the tip is, I think is a good thing. I feel like we get a lot of that naturally from, from folks, but maybe there is a way to, to formalize it. And I certainly think that if a, if a project does go up in cost, having that proponent come in and, and actually have them explain, you know, to the MPO why that is, I think is, is, is critical, you know, as, as well. Ben? Yeah, something that just um, hit my mind while you were talking was this might be an opportunity to um, to try out, uh, like you were saying, with the if this project scores high enough, you know, we kind of assume we're committed to it. This might be an opportunity to set in some some kind of tiered structure. I know, like when Federal Highway is looking at our project list, they identify certain projects that are like, okay, we want to keep a close eye on these, right? Um, and so they have a closer oversight of them. So it might be something to sort of mirror that where if it's a particularly high scoring project so we know it's it's a great benefit or it's a project in a community that hasn't had a project on the tip in the last decade or something to that effect like there could be some trigger where you know that particular project is a project of concern with a little bit more mpo staff involvement in the project development just as, as far as keeping track of milestones as a way of easing into this um, process Right. I mean, there is something to be said about, you know, putting a little like good, you know, anxiety into the proponent to want to keep their costs down and get their project done. Um, something like that. But, but I, I, you know, I feel like we got to strike the right balance. I'm, I'm really kind of interested, um, you know, Frank Tramontosi, I don't know if, how closely you've been paying attention to this conversation. Um, I'd love to get your perspective, you know, because I feel like you have been on both sides. You, you know, you've been on the MassDOT side for many years, and now you're on the, you know, the city side. I think you've been in the consultant side too, as well. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on, you know, the like kind of the the the, the uh, like the time, you know, when a when a project is along in the process to, to have a good sense of its cost and like like some of these things around addressing cost increases. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so I can tell you that sometimes you have increases in costs because district wants to add in certain um, amenities or whatever into the project. So um, oftentimes the proponent or the municipality won't argue with district or MassDOT Boston. Uh, when it comes to adding things into the project, um, in the end result is cost increases. Uh, MassDOT reviews the costs every step of the way. And when you have a cost increase at the very last minute, it's not necessarily the fault of the municipality uh, or the consultant, because sometimes MassDOT also says, oh, your estimate is too high on this particular item because this has been coming in at a certain cost. So they end up lowering costs on certain items. So it's across the board. It's everybody's uh, issue. Um, I, and there's always the um, contingencies that are added in uh, that don't necessarily end up covering uh, the actual costs as far as police details are concerned, um, uh, any kind of um, traffic mitigation, traffic management, oftentimes MassDOT will want to use a percentage. Uh, in that percentage in a municipality such as Boston, for instance, for police details, uh, that percentage is not high enough um, in, a, in any highly urbanized area. It may be, mm -hmm. Uh, appropriate uh, out in a suburban area, but not necessarily good enough in an urbanized area. So the, it's across the board. Uh, there's no particular blame for just consultants or the municipality. 
off a mascot because as projects progress, there's always adding more and more into the project. That's my read on it. Yeah, you know, I, I think you're right. And I think the challenge is we're trying to establish, you know, kind of a, like a policy that is, is fair and clear to address cost increases. And I think the challenge is that every, every project has its own sort of nuance to it. Um, and that's what makes it hard, right? To, to, say to, a, to say to a proponent like, well, we're not gonna treat you the same as we, we treated another project unless there's kind of a, a clear way of, of figuring that out. Um, I think that's one of the challenges we, we have before us is sort of trying to create like some some just some transparency to doing something um, that isn't just continuing to, to commit with projects. And, uh, and it might be that the, like the easiest thing we can do is just try to make sure what we're, we're programming projects that are a little further along in the process. But yeah, Frank, I think that's a, you know, that's a, a good perspective. Um, what do others think, what do others think about just these questions here? So I think in terms of next steps on this, um, you know, the other issues that, that we, you know, kind of came up through this process and Brian and, and Jay are not here who are most interested in this is this, you know, Jay was really pushing on the design issue and Brian was really interested in kind of this idea around, um, you know, creating a different, a totally different structure where we might have tiered funding with matches based on different project types. That idea seems very dramatic, uh, a change. Um, and I, I kind of feel like that's a, something to put off for another day and, and like maybe sort of, you know, for a longer kind of conversation. Um, that I, I feel like the design piece too has a lot of, um, I don't know, sort of, cascade effect of, of issues associated with it. So maybe, I, I don't know, maybe we could talk about those two. I know those those folks aren't in the meeting right now, but that can help us determine kind of some, some next steps for our next meeting. Yeah, Len? Well, I, I was on board too uh, with Jay's idea uh, or feelings about uh, let's take it on the design um, aspect of it. But me, my question um, to Ken earlier, me kind of made me pause on that a whole lot. So I have to re-evaluate it, but, but, but essentially I mean, we, in some way, we are going to be committing to communities you know, and, and we need to do so in a way that is as supportive as possible uh, because, cause, cause, and we need to do so in conjunction with MassDOT. Uh, uh, and cause, cause we, we can try to, you know, wave a stick at communities me but but they're hard up me for for resources mm -hmm. me, and, and so so um there's just not much alternative they have I mean when things go awry me, and unless we are seeing cases of malfeasance and uh we, we need to i think commit stick with our commitment and just try to make the process better me so that we have either less unexpected adjustments I mean um or we provide a buffer, I mean, so that when I mean, these adjustments happen, we don't have some domino effect on the rest of uh, the, the, the tip and um, the, 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 the years after that year. That's it, thanks. Yeah, I guess that's the other issue that we haven't really talked a lot about is, is about you know, creating more contingency, essentially. I mean, these projects are supposed to have contingency built into their um, their cost estimates. But I think what you've raised, Len, is like, should the MPO build more sort of contingency into, you know, not fully program all the the, the target funds each year. The, the downside to that is, you know, if we do have remaining funds, you know, or, or we, we wouldn't be able to fund as many projects. And if we do have remaining funds, it's very difficult to squeeze things in unless they're, you know, unless there's a, a project that can, you know, that can can take advantage, you know, is 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 far enough along and ready to take advantage of it. Um, so I don't know. Maybe we could get 
folks perspective on that about adding sort of more contingency and not fully programming the tip each year. Or we can think about that one for, ne for next time. I think um, <clears throat> our next meeting is, is on the 29th, correct? We have that scheduled. I mean, we're starting to kind of, I feel like move into kind of the narrowing phase now of, of trying to come up with a, a policy recommendation. And I guess what I'm thinking for the next meeting would be, you know, we don't, we don't have some of our members, we don't even have a quorum right now, uh, would be to, um, you know, to send out a communication that really, I think, highlights these three areas that we've gone over today, the kind of the, you know, when do we pro, pro when do we program projects at what level of kind of design, the, the, um, the cost effectiveness, you know, options, and then this question around kind of touch, you know, pro, you know, touchstones and, you know, what do we want to maybe potentially require for project proponents to, to come forward with. Um, I don't know, Matt, I'm looking at like Matt or Kate, I don't know if there's a way to like put that into a standalone document or, or survey or something like that to try to just force people to engage with it so that when we come on the 29th, people have done some thinking and we can um, have a, you know, have more of a, have more of a discussion about like, like how we now want to kind of develop a, a policy recommendation. And we can include this question of, you know, do, should we budget more contingency in the future? Yeah, Len? I, I like that idea, you know, because I mean, certainly to the extent that we have questions and things to think about before the meeting, that helps me because I mean, I'm thinking about these questions that I'm seeing now, and that's why I'm not chiming in, and, and partly because sure. I don't want to chime in too much. Uh, but the other thing too is uh, the the um, the notes or the memorandum from September 15, 2016, that Matt provided, I thought was very good. I mean, it was very interesting to see the questions at the bottom. Uh, um, they're very similar to a certain extent. And, and, and there are yeah. even more questions, I think, that are good for us to take into consideration. I looked on the website. I couldn't find the minutes for that meeting. Uh, so Matt, would it, might be, would it be possible for me to get the minutes for that meeting and, and maybe some minutes me before and after that meeting? Because I'm kind of interested in what um, cause that conversation to happen. And I'm definitely interested in the conversation that happened at that meeting, maybe some meetings after that, that uh, will follow up. Because, because, because I mean, there are smart people uh, on this board past and present meet. And so uh, it'd be good to see what was the thinking back then to a very similar situation. Thanks. Sorry, just to jump in for a clip. My audio broke up a little bit. Um, which meeting are, are you asking for more information on? Uh, just a minute for the September 15, 2016 meeting. Okay. I couldn't find it on the website. And this calendar uh, for meetings seems, seems to go back only to 2018. Yeah, Lynn, we can get that. We have all the we have the meeting minutes. We just uh, by a certain year it starts to be archived. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and Eric, just to answer your earlier question, I mean, we can definitely put together maybe just like a short. We could certainly post these slides and then, you know, even put together a short, sort of a short survey or, you know, summary list of questions for, for folks to engage with before the next, um, the next meeting. So happy to do that if that's helpful. I think a summary list of questions and say for, you know, I think I, to me, I, I'm looking, you know, maybe at others here, but I think the agenda for the 29th is really to drill in on these three areas that we've gone over today um, and ask, and, and, and I think maybe we can put that, you know, those questions into um, a single document and send that out to folks. Say, this is what the agenda is going to be. We really want folks to think about this. Um, and, and then we come back on the 29th and try to come up with a, you know, a recommendation. Does that sound good? And are there any other things that you think we're, we're kind of missing here or other topics? Okay, good. I think we're getting there. This is this is really great today. Um, let's see. Yeah, are there any any other members' items? 
so it's not seeing any. Um, so our next meeting is Thursday, July 29th at 10 a.m. Is that a standalone meeting or are there any other, that's not an MPO, a regular MPO meeting, right? Just a standalone meeting. It's a standalone. Um, right. It might be a good idea when we send that document out also to ask for people to find out if they're going to be there because if we don't have a quorum you know it's it's you know i feel like if we don't have you know brian and jay and a few other people um it's it, i feel like it's hard to kind of move forward um so maybe we can do that and find out okay okay Great. So um, I forget. Do I need a formal motion to adjourn, or can we can we adjourn? I'll do a motion to adjourn. Okay. Can I get a second? A second. Okay. Great. So without objection, we're adjourn adjourned. Thank you all for your time. This was really great. Appreciate it. And thank you, Matt. Wonderful presentations today. This was this was really fabulous. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye.